Welcome uh, everyone to, to this panel, which is the most inno innovative development project um, finalist uh, presentation. Um, the most innovative, uh, I'm, I'm Francesco Bino, Head of Programs at the Global Development Network, and I'm very glad to be chairing this, this session today. Uh, um, as some of you might already know, the, the most innovative development project is a part of the Global Development Awards competition. Um, this is a very uh, unique program at GDN, not only because it's one of the longest uh, uh, lasting uh, program um, uh, of GDN, it's been running since 2000, uh, thanks to the general support from the Ministry of Finance uh, of the Government of Japan, but also from um, the PHRD Trust Fund at, at the World Bank, who, who administers the fund. But it's also a very unique project in the sense that it includes, uh, program in the sense that it includes both uh, a research um, competition, and an implementation competition. So a competition, an award for researchers and an award for NGOs. And the most innovative development project is precisely the award for, um, for NGOs. Uh, um, along the years we've dispersed um, over 4 million USD to, to research projects and, 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 um, and implementation projects that really had some promise to, to, to contribute significantly to advancing development across across developing countries uh, you know the community of researchers we've, we've, we've been involved in this in the selection processes is uh, is very important we're talking about over almost 9000 9000 people um, uh, of the 100 awards um, and, and, and just to to you know to say a few more words about uh, um, the specific uh, award that you know three finalists will be competing for today uh, it's an award that really rewards Reward innovation in implementation, uh, um, and it's it's implementing in two in two, in two phases. Uh, the first phase of of um, of twelve months um, uh, really allows uh, organisations to to expand on programs that are already already running in their own organisation uh, uh, to get visibility and test and test their strength. Um, now that the first two. Uh, winners of this program will then have access and compete for a much larger grant uh, of um, two hundred thousand um, dollars under the auspices of the japanese social development fund um, to scale up to scale up the project today's uh, competition um, is on the topic of quality urban infrastructure and community uh, driven government governance and what we we the projects we'll be, we'll be learning about today um, are really working to advance inclusive planning, design, implementation, and evaluation of urban infrastructure through community driven inclusive approaches to citizen engagement with specific attention to the poorest and the most vulnerable groups in cities and uh, municipalities in developing countries. The topic of uh, the MIDP award changes every year, and uh, and this is um, we are running three categories. In fact, a free 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 parallel uh, competition of the MIDP award this year, and, and this one is on, on this topic, which is also part of the uh, of Japan's ODA agenda. But obviously, uh, a development issue that uh, is uh, of course very very important um, and relevant to to many countries. Um, around the world. Um, just a few words just to, to, to give you a sense of, of what the process looks like. Uh, this is the very last step in, in, a, long, uh, um, in a long process of, of vetting and, and, and uh, shortlisting and selection of projects. Uh, um, we had over 100 applicants to, to, to the competition this year. Um, and this is a step where we, you know, a jury of, of experts um, on the topic itself uh, and, and evaluates uh, uh, the, three, the three finalists. And that the criteria that they'll use to evaluate the finalists and decide who gets what grants uh, um, are, are, are on the screen, of course, innovativeness, uh, uh, clarity, uh, uh, the social impact of the project, uh, uh, particularly on the most vulnerable populations, um, the scalability, replicability, and, and scope for expansion of the project, visibility, and the quality of um, the presentation let me um, let me just say um, a few words um, about our, our panel um, today we have um, three, 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 three people on the panel um, the first I would like to introduce and if, if you if the jurors can can switch on the, the camera it would be, would be great so that everybody can see you um, so Elena uh, Parula, if you can switch on your camera uh, excellent. 
Um, so the first one, uh, first I would like to introduce Elena Nkole, uh, um, who's program manager for the Japan Policy and Human Resource Development Fund uh, um, and the Social uh, and Japan Social Development Fund in the World Bank's uh, Group um, Development Finance Vice Presidency um, for Trust Funds and Partner Relations. Her department bridges the World Bank Group with external partners to design and manage game-changing partnerships, trust funds, and innovative finance initiatives to serve critical development priorities. Uh, uh, welcome, Elena. And Elena, of course, is a, is a big um, is a big ally in the implementation of this program and has been for for very many years. So thanks, thanks for joining us today. Uh, um, the second person, the second juror, I would like to introduce is. Paru, uh, Parul um, um, Agarwala. Um, Parul, are, are you connected? Yes. Uh, we can yes, I am. You. I'm sorry, I'm having a bit of uh, trouble with my video feed. I'll fix it. No problem. Eventually. Welcome. Um, so, Mr. Parul is, is the country program manager for UN Habitat um, India. In this role, uh, um, she works on promoting sustainability, inclusion, and resilience into the urban policy frameworks, urban planning, and management. She has extensive experience in implementing citywide initiatives for sustainable spatial planning and local economic growth, while applying urban design concepts for visible urban transformations. Prior to India, she managed a clean and green cities program at UN Habitat in Afghanistan, uh, developed to improve lives of the urban poor with a special focus on women by providing uh, job opportunities and stability through paid work. Uh, Mrs. Agrawala has also worked as a city planner in New York City, Department of City Planning in the US, and with the World Bank's global practice um, of rural, urban rural disaster risk and social development based in Washington, D.C., and I couldn't think of a better profile um, um, for, for, for a juror on this on this competition um, today. Uh, last but not least, uh, um, we have uh, Ramona angeles uh, Ramona, many of you have seen her in, in, the, in the conference, of course, already. Uh, she's a director, she's currently director of strategic partnerships at, at GDN, where she also leads the communication unit and directs um, GDN's Global Development Conference, including this one we are, we are, we are part of um, today. Um, from 2010 to 2017, she was also director of programs at GDN and was overseeing the global portfolio of research capacity building and collaborative research programs um, that GDN um, runs. Prior to joining GDN, she worked, she worked in, in consulting in, in the States um, and with the US Chamber of Commerce and uh, the World Bank. Um, she's here also because she has written on governance, migration, of course, and of course capacity building, uh, uh, including a, a, a recent book in 2017 uh, um, on, 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 on governance and public service um, delivery. So welcome, welcome Ramona uh, uh, in this panel um, as a juror. Now, the f here are the finalists. Uh, the international, um, these are the name of the finalists and we'll start, uh, I think I, I suggest we just jump into into the presentation of uh, um, of the projects. Uh, this is how um, it will work. Uh, we'll have uh, each project present for uh, 15 minutes, followed by a discussion with the jury, but also with the audience uh, for 10, 15, uh, 15 minutes. So I'd like to invite everyone who's connected to please feel free to ask questions, uh, react to the presentations as they happen. We will gather uh, the questions and I'll make sure that we ask those questions that, that the the finalists um, do address um, your questions during the, the discussion time. Um, I I think we, we can we, we we should just start and and the first the first presentation will be um, by two team members of the NGO Bharat Raksha Bharat, um, also known as Save the Children India, was part of the of the global Save the Children um, family. The presenters are. Uh, Pragya Bhatt and, and uh, Sripurna uh, Majumdar who share the presentation and the project is called Dream Accelerator Project. The floor of yours is yours, uh, um, Pragya, uh, um, and uh, good luck. So thank you so much. And first I would like to extend huge thanks to GDN for such an enriching process so far. And we've come this far to present this innovation, a project which is really 
very, very special to Save the Children. Uh, those of you who are here, we all know Save the Children as a child rights organization where we are defenders of child rights working for the rights of children. Uh, but this special project, which is Dream Accelerator, truly demarcates and distinguishes itself where it's from child centric, it's moving on to child led and where children's participation has really shown us. And we have witnessed how when you meaningfully engage children, they can influence and inform and lead change in their community uh, from gender equality to ending child labor to uh, leading their voice to the duty bearers. Uh, and that's something very special. And I'm reminded of Gandhi's quote, and I would paraphrase because I don't uh, remember verbatim, but when he said that when the real lessons in life or the greatest lessons of life we learn uh, from not so-called great learned men, but from the so-called ignorant children, only if we humble ourselves and stoop down to listen to them. And this project has been an absolutely enriching experience even for us, where right from the conception to the execution, children have been a part of that process of developing what they wanted to do. So it's not top down, but it's informed by children where they position themselves as a leader in their community. Uh, and in terms of impact, I clearly see that as a pilot, we started it in 2020, which was also an year, which was a challenging year for all of us across the world. But this pilot started last year in 2020. And quickly, we were able to scale with the second grant coming in the fray. And we are now scaling it to multiple different locations. So that's the innovation of this project, where it has clear steps and results woven into the design, uh, which is informed and led by children and communities who are impacting change wherever they are. And it has allowed us to scale. Because why? Because it also has innovation inbuilt. It has child participation inbuilt, and it has scalability and sustainability, which is very clearly integrated in the program design, where Shakuna will walk you through the details in terms of what are the different aspects and approaches that has helped us define this. This is really all of our heart that we are presenting to you, uh, because this concerns children, and it was an opportunity for us and our team uh, to engage children in advocacy and campaigning. And it has been an absolutely learning process for us. So I would invite uh, Shapurna and over to you, Shapurna, to talk Thanks, more. So, about so yeah. a little bit context about India. Uh, India's 41% uh, of India's population are young people. And uh, as you know, at Save the Children, we care a lot about child rights. Uh, but India had made a lot of movement before the pandemic on a lot of indicators. But with the pandemic, an entire generation has been set back. And more than 10 million girls are out of school and 10 million children are being forced to work. Uh, so in that situation, we see that our programs have taken a new shape. And uh, we also see that one of the chief drivers of our initiatives within the pandemic and beyond have become the children's groups that we work with. Um, of course, Save the Children has a lot of reach. Within, we work with 12 states in India currently. Um, so the Dream Accelerator project, which is specifically what Pragya was mentioning, is to empower potential change makers in uh, the society. These are child champions and youth advocates that we work with. Uh, they are talking about right to food, uh, right to you know express education, sanitation, protection, urban development, all kinds of infrastructure that affect and impact their lives. Uh, there are four steps that we take to engage them. The first stage is learning. Uh, we train, but we also learn from them, their context. Uh, then we uh, like help them uh, facilitate designing their projects based on what they feel is critical in their lives. Uh, then helping them network. And sometimes they take the initiative as well to connect us with the key stakeholders in that area. Uh, when it comes to, I'm so sorry, uh, when it comes to all the key stakeholders in their community, networking with them. And then fourth is act. So they demand for quality services and whether it be social services or infrastructural service services. And this is done through advocacy that they do or at the local level. Currently, we've engaged with 1500 uh, champions throughout through trainings, public mobilization. They've been awarded prestigious awards like Nari Shakti, UNB awards. Uh, they've been nominated for Children's Peace Prize. 
they were working with Bill and Melinda Gates as the goalkeeper. So uh, the model itself is to further community driven engagement, but also showcasing the power of community driven engagement. Uh, children's voices are taken into consideration or at the center of this movement. Um, so a little bit about the approaches that we take, uh, child rights reporting, we've witnessed children and youth reporting on domestic violence cases through the pandemic, uh, child marriages that have taken place, they've helped stop that through the police system, uh, you know, sewage systems that are not being uh, properly maintained, they've ma make sure that they've written to the the, to the parties who are taking care of those, um, you know, infrastructure. Essentially, countless letters that they write to governing bodies on all the child rights violations, and they collect evidence. So that's one of the ways that they ensure accountability from the governing bodies because they're collecting evidence through signature campaigns, through pictures, and in a way, they're showing society a mirror. And um, that's what we've also realize that the community is not just their own, but the ones neighboring in their communities have also benefit, benefited from this approach. Uh, they've also used a lot of digital uh, you know, tools like WhatsApp, Instagram Live, Facebook groups uh, to connect during the pandemic since the pilot was taken, taken on during the pandemic. And we've seen that children take on the digital world so quickly and the youth also somehow you know teach each other in a way so communication is flowing and not uh, you know doesn't stop so the principle of child rights governance uh, is propelling this initiative and also issues that are you know affecting children are not off the radar and governance needs to be accountable responsive inclusive and transparent so um, the the two outcomes that we've seen, the first one being on training, we've seen and measured that there's been a 70% improvement on their agency and the ability for them to inform on child rights violations. Uh, on the second, we had detailed implementation plans in place for children and youth to lead their own projects that they have designed. And we've seen that on the basis of the detailed implementation plan, they have successfully implemented 100% of those projects, nine projects that we took. A little snapshot for you guys on how, what the pilot looked like. So we've done some training. Essentially, we're running in seven states right now in India, and we scaled up very recently. But these are the states that we have uh, proposed this for. Um, the module that we have in place is very easily adaptable to the situation of digital use and even face to face what uh, what we have seen. Um, so it applies to anyone who has digital access uh, on rights, power, governance, change, critical thinking and their role in the community, essentially. Uh, I'm going to take you through uh, a little bit on the highlights of this uh, project. Uh, through nine micro projects, which are led by nine children, we managed to reach 1500 children. And uh, we're going to talk about a li little bit about two of those champions uh, that we engaged. Um, essentially, the reach of the children that we trained has been through children's groups, through mother's groups. And uh, they, they also facilitate because there's already a functionality for them to be engaged with the duty bearers there, engaged with the stakeholders there. So it's very easy, easier for them to, when they're already on ground, to engage with that community. Um, so we've seen exceptional um, you know, case studies on that, and two of them I'm be sharing with you today. Uh, this is Nisha. Um, Nisha was nine years old when she first heard the word school. Uh, before that, she didn't even know. She didn't know where all the children disappeared in the middle of the day. Uh, and she hasn't looked back since. Uh, she's one of our strongest advocates. Uh, she raises awareness on education in her own community, but also within the format of the global community. Uh, she's been profiled globally and also uh, at the stage of like, you know, being a panel member uh, with many other champions and some of the key minister of education that she's met and, uh, you know, essentially put her word forward on what she believes is the, is the right way to make sure that girls get the education they deserve. The key impact for her has been that she's raised the school enrollment in her community by 80% of girls. And uh, that's been really tremendous for us. And we look forward to everything that she can do. She wants to be a teacher and we hope that she can do a lot more as that as well. This is Vishnu. 
Bishnu is from a migrant labor community. Essentially, uh, he, his, his uh, context has been such that the community has been in flux from cities to different areas. They work in brick clins. And uh, he has been staying in Malda for some time. And he believes that the reason why people are still struggling with uh, education or even sending their children to school is poverty. And in order for us to even approach that problem, we need to start with sensitization. So his initial project was based on sensitizing and engaging children, but he moved that forward by also sensitizing parents and government uh, functionaries who are there part of uh, that entire area. So uh, each project runs as a social enterprise uh, along with aid of mentors. They have a mentor that they have assigned and that mentor you know reports back to us as well we also interact with the children directly on what their independent impact indicators would be what what's the progress on their detailed implementation plans and the budgets that they are also managing with the help of the mentors so some of the examples of the micro projects that i'd like to say is like you know um, clean water clean toilets waste management uh, with respect to health, like in, uh, vaccine hesitancy, uh, infrastructure of primary health care, uh, when, we, when we come to, you know, the COVID scenario, disposal of the hazardous material that they've been, uh, you know, using essentially. In child protection, uh, they're advocating for infrastructure like district child protection units, child welfare communities. Many, many of them are actually part of these committees and they uh, you know are the interface between the children and the governing bodies uh, with respect to gender they've been uh, advocating on public space uh, safety uh, with lighting and transportation uh, in education as you saw like nisha is a school enrollment and quality infrastructure within the education system so each of the micro projects as part of the design the young advocates have managed to build relationships with their local governing bodies all the way from the local till the parliament. So uh, many champions are part of the uh, the way uh, the, those committees work as well and spokespeople essentially. So the innovative part about this project is that children and youth set the agenda. We are um, learning from them. Uh, they are leading the, 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 the projects. So right from the inception uh, till the implementation and then even for us to work through this, uh, you know, for us to pitch this, um, they helped us build that that entire piece. So monitoring, implementing, evaluation. Of course, we have mentors to help them guide, but essentially they are the ones who are doing the real leading of the setting the agenda. So with that active participation comes active citizenship. So since they've already been part of this process, so in such a big way they find themselves taking civic action and asking for equal access to affordable quality services whether it be social services or infrastructural um, so in a way we are wanting for this innovation to be part of many of our programs it's a model right now and we want this to take root in a larger way within the sector of a way of working and also within all the programs that save the children um, has currently so it's of course participation and citizenship are two of the fundamentals of the project so sustaining impact uh, for us we see that we need to train a lot many trainers uh, we need to ensure that uh, there's cost effectiveness within the summits that we hold so that they can come to the same platform so this quote like you can see i'm only one person but imagine there are 100 nishas like me so that's the kind of uh, impact that we're hoping to achieve. Uh, and of course, recognizing their, uh, recognizing their uh, contribution to that. So scaling up, uh, this is some of the estimated reach that we hope that if we get this grant, uh, we can scale up with a peer networking system and skill building uh, training. And um, essentially, we envisage a peer scalable, scalability model and under the project that also builds in sustainability. So this network will further be linked to existing coalitions, child rights organizations, and also our other programs within Save the Children. So getting this grant will be a huge validation for our champions uh, to ensure that they've also actively participated in this process uh, through interviews and feedback, et cetera. 
So we're really sort of ready uh, to hear your questions. And thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sripurna. You, you're absolutely on time. And thanks for a very clear presentation. I'd like now to invite the, the, the jury members, so Elena, Ramona, and, and Parul, to, to, to take the floor with questions, uh, comments um, about, about the project. Of course, you have seen, uh, um, you have seen the also the project proposal um, beyond, beyond just the presentation. Uh, so feel free to ask questions about anything. This is a chance for Sripurna and her team to, 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 to clear any doubt you might have. Who would like to go first? Elena, any, any, any question from you? Yes, I can go first, yeah. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the uh, presentation. That's really points to the right direction. I like the overall framework. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to ask you what's, uh, I have a few, but just in the uh, time. What's the age range of these kids that are leading? From what age? 15 to 24. 15, okay. The, those that are between the ages of 15 and 18, do they go to school still while they are part yes. of the championship? Or how do they? How are they yes. able to go to school and do that? So we have a way of uh, scheduling this with them. So mm -hmm. uh, they decide their own schedule. So what is the time that they can give us? Uh, that's an entire process when we're building the proposal. Um, so for example, some kids are only able to give us the weekends. Uh, so we work with them on weekends. Uh, some of the kids are able to give us one or two hours within the day uh, spread out over the week. So uh, for us, uh, education, shelter, protection comes first and the projects and what they have engaged with us on comes second. So we need to ensure their basic uh, rights are already catered to before we even start like discussing what they're going to be helping us to do or what they want to imagine a world better, but they need to first figure out their own immediate reality. And, and the one quick question to allow others to also ask, uh, in terms of the, the, the strategic aspect of this, it's all points to the right direction, but in looking at the areas of focus, which are all very good, but it, it said the children not spreading itself too thinly by following this multi-sectoral approach. Uh, and how are you able to really measure impact when you're looking at gender-based violence to uh, child protection and all these other water and others? You're not spreading this too thin to really measure impact. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that question. Uh, so we are taking the lead of the child and youth. So they are setting their own indicators. Uh, so essentially, if it's a gender-based project, uh, we work with the child who wants to work on gender with what the indicators of, of success would look like. So each of the micro projects has a different set of uh, indicators which imply to success. Um, we don't believe in uh, spreading ourselves too thin. We think that children have a variety of issues that they want to work on. So uh, if they are given the lead, they are able to measure. I think that's, that's the understanding, the maturity level that they have. So essentially, we need to follow that with uh, the kind of social enterprise that they want to run. Um, if, sorry, if I may just add here, uh, Helena, uh, these children are selected from our program process. Uh, which are who are a part of our program. So that also allows us as a custodian of child rights to ensure so they are already engaged in the ecosystem of save the children in some way or the other. So we are able to impact larger change and children just become amplifiers of that change. So the issues they're already exposed to and they are connected to the organization. So we pick up children from uh, and select the nomination and the selection process follows uh, so that we can sustain engagement with our children on an ongoing basis and they have already been exposed so even when shapona was talking about criteria they should have been exposed or been a part of children's group that's the first first basic criteria that we have set uh, set for ourselves that children should have the basic knowledge and how we can build their leadership and uh, their engagement and participation and active citizenship as it were so that's where the sustainability and engagement uh, uh, addressing your question that you raised as to how do we ensure measure impact some impact larger impact is measured by the organization 
uh, in terms of as custodian of child rights, and they become amplifiers of the child rights agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Pragya. Um, who would like to go uh, next, Ramona or Parul? Any, any question from you, Ramona? Sure, I can go next. I have a couple of questions. Thank you again for the presentation. I always like to see um, children put in the driver's seat. Um, and I think you outline the different stages of your um, project and the outcomes so far. I have a couple of questions. At some point, you mentioned that you noticed a 70% improvement in agency for these children, if I got that correctly. I wanted you to elaborate a little bit on that. What do you mean by that and how do you define agency? Second question is, what is the role of the parents and do you need their buy-in? Um, and the third, and this perhaps connects to the budget as well, um, you're obviously financing these micro projects as well, right? So it's not just identifying and training um, the, one, the champions, but they're micro projects as such. And the bulk, in fact, of the funding goes to that. Um, how do you see these mic the replicability of the micro projects themselves, not the training and the digital modules, but the micro projects themselves? So uh, the first question on how do you measure agency? Um, so essentially, when we're taking them through the training process, we have a, a basically a, essentially many questions that we ask them before the training begins. Um, these questions are also aimed at understanding how engaged they are with their stakeholders. So uh, do they are they aware of the stakeholders who are around them? And also, how many times are they engaging with those stakeholders? And at the end of the training, there's a middle also, essentially, after. So we have six modules. So after three modules, we have another like check in with them on the same like uh, uh, part where how many times are you engaging with the stakeholders who are, in fact, um, you know, um, influencing your world, uh, whether it be the municipal community, whether it be the punch leader in India, we have that system. Um, it could be the student uh, council or the parents council within the uh, within the school. Um, so all these kinds of stakeholders, whether they're aware of them and how many times they're engaging with them, uh, assigns like what kind of agency they have with respect to the issues that they care about. And we feel that the measurement comes on the, the raising uh, their issues to those stakeholders. So Sorry, if I could also exemplify agency, uh, Ramona. I mean, uh, say Nisha, whose story uh, Shapuna talked about, she led a petition to the education minister uh, asking about prioritizing girls' education, which garnered about 65,000 signatures from public. So she wrote the Hindi text of it, the language she understood. Uh, the, we never, you know, we always let children determine what they want to say as long as they know. So I think that petition. Uh, and that that's agency for us, uh, whether there was this young person in uh, in Rajasthan somewhere who wrote to the Child Rights Commission to say that during COVID, uh, there was a violation of child rights happening in his area. So there are these apart from what uh, Shipurna mentioned, we also have these actions, active actions that they take in their community, uh, which impacts other children, not just in their community, but probably in the larger context, as it were. Uh, I think your second question was about uh, the parents. The yeah. parents, yeah. So we have a parent declaration form uh, that goes mm -hmm. to the parents. It's basically consent uh, on in terms of how many hours that they're able to. They're consenting that children will be engaging with us, and along with that, any photographs or video footage or anything that materials that they're sharing with us. Um, their consent on each of those materials uh, and our usage of that as well. I think that's a policy across Save the Children on any of the programs that we do. And uh, budgets, uh, the financing budgets. piece. Yes. So, um, like you said, yes, chunk of the money is micro projects, and each of those micro projects has a separate budget and cash flow for it. Um, and we see that, uh, of course, we would not be like in terms of sustainability, we don't see us funding those micro projects endlessly. Uh, the social enterprise model is such that they would be able to raise their own. So we have had one of our champions, Anju from Punjab, who has managed to raise her own funding and start her own NGO, her own social enterprise. So we envision that for uh, many of the kids that we work with. Currently. 
Thank you. And I'd like to ask Parul uh, to, to come in uh, with her own questions. Parul? Yes. Yes. So thank you, uh, Pragya and Tripurna. Very engaging uh, you know, presentation. Uh, I have a few questions. One, on the training modules that you have, um, uh, you have mentioned in your proposal that you work with both uh, children living in urban slums and in rural areas. So have you, um, through your past experience, streamlined these training modules across the four or five core areas, the protection, shelter, and so on? Um, for the for the children, or do you uh, you know again customize them to uh, to a specific local context, and um, and then secondly, um, again uh, sort of building. I'm curious about these uh, uh, these initiatives that would be led by the young uh, children, you know, child champions and youth advocates. Um, what is the type of first of all like. How much of the, how much of support um, is, uh, is your organization providing to each um, of these child champions? Like, what's the ratio to uh, you know the, the experts ratio to uh, to the children? And um, and then uh, and then lastly, um, how do you one say a certain um, uh, you know these uh, youth advocates um, young kids have. Uh, uh, made made a mark, uh, you know, uh, led a successful um, initiative. How do you then um, introduce them to the wider network, or you know, like what's what's the, uh, you know, what what's how do you like document the lessons learned so that that itself can also be, um, you know, enhanced and amplified. Uh, so in terms of context uh, of the module, so currently the context is of state-wise. Uh, we don't have, um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, urban and rural setup. It's more state-wise. And out of the six modules, four of them are more larger in terms of broader, and two of them are contextualized exactly to the state. That's how we're currently working. Pragya, do you want to go on the, um, you know, the part where how we introduce children to the world um, once they are successful? Um, maybe you want to add something on that? Sure. So, uh, Parul, I mean, I think that's a very a good question. And honestly, also this project, as I said, it's a very, very recent one, very piloted. And I think, you know, like even as child rights organization that we said at the very outset that we are very child centered. Uh, and this is uh, something that we have piloted, you know, like in action. Uh, in theory, of course, we are child led, but we also wanted to uh, exemplify something to show that children when they are meaningfully engaged uh, they have uh, they have the potential to inform and influence their surroundings and lead change in their community as mentioned earlier uh, and we have been engaging even with, even before the micro projects we have been providing uh, platforms for them to be spokespeople for the organization so that's something that we have been doing for quite a number of years i think as a part of our campaign and advocacy uh, where not just as a token, but ensuring that if we are even organizing an event, for instance, with a minister, children have an interface. And we have many such uh, processes around elections. We have something called, uh, though I'm digressing, but just wanted to exemplify it for you that to how there is a sustainability model built into it. And this is something which has seen is a consolidation of the lot of work that we have done. So Vote for Children is a very unique initiative at which we, uh, which we piloted in 2014 around elections where children draft their own demands, uh, where we consult them to say that, what do you want of your political leaders? So there are a set of demands that Save the Children would submit on behalf of children. And there would be a set of uh, demands where children would themselves through consultative process. And just to exemplify that for you, in 2019 elections, we had consulted uh, 12,000 children across uh, 10 locations and 10 states in India. And these formulated demands uh, were uh, submitted to 65 political leaders across different contexts. I just have these numbers because that for me was very, very empowering experience and that for an organ and that a child led. So that is something the genesis of this dream accelerator emerges from our engagement with children as spokespeople, uh, as uh, leading the agenda for the organization as a part because we represent Shapuna and I represent the campaigning function of the organization. So we have been able to demonstrate that when children speak, if probably Nisha was here, you would like to hear her story than us talking on her behalf. And that would be something which would inspire you. 
so we truly believe as a as you know two people who are representing the organization here and what we have been able to demonstrate that when children speak the world listens and that's what we are trying to do through these very uh, pilot initiative but that's something that has been a part of our core that children are leaders children are campaigners they are advocates so yeah Thank you, Pragya. I think I think that's a very good way to to, to wrap, wrap wrap up the the, um, the, the discussion. Thank, thanks a lot, to Shreporna and, and Pragya, for the presentation and for the, the clear answers. Uh, um, we now need to move to our next uh, uh, finalist and uh, uh, and next uh, finalist project. Um, the project is called Expansion uh, uh, Nepal Waste Map, uh, um, a digital waste management system, community driven and powered uh, governance. The NGO is called Clean Up Nepal, and uh, our speaker today is Amod Karmacharya, who is the executive director of the NGO. Amod, um, the floor is yours. 15 minutes and then discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, no, namaste, everyone. Uh, my name is Amod Karmacharya, and I represent a nonprofit uh, organization called Clean Up Nepal. Uh, we primarily focus on waste management sector uh, by con connecting. Uh, educating and empowering communities and stakeholders through a series of uh, people-centric uh, approach. Um, and also, um, while we're on this one, I would also like to uh, showcase some of our uh, key projects um, that we are doing in Nepal. Uh, the first one is called Zero Waste at School. By name, Zero Waste at School is an initiative of Clean in Nepal uh, with a vision to reduce the amount of waste produced and disposed by the school and get, gradually take it to zero level in the long run. The program also aims to um, <clears throat> for a behavioral change among the school administration, teachers, staff, and students. Um, next, we, we have uh, Nepal Waste Map. Uh, this is one of the key projects, and this is, this is a project we will also be impl implementing uh, uh, in, in, in the upcoming, if we have the support. Uh, well, Nepal Waste Map is basically a digital waste management system uh, which includes a comprehensive web-based dash dashboard and a mobile uh, application. It is currently implement is being implemented in several municipalities in Nepal. The technology platform allows cities and municipalities to undertake uh, powerful analysis of waste-related data, uh, provide waste collection and management information uh, that enables citizens to report waste dumping, burning, and irregular waste collection services. Next one uh, that we have is nationwide uh, cleanup. Uh, we also call it a nationwide campaign. This is an annual event uh, which was undertaken by Clean Nepal when we started in 2014 uh, with an aim to unite stakeholders to work toward a cleaner and greener Nepal. And uh, Cleaner Nepal works to provide an enabling environment to improve solid waste management system in Nepal by working closely with local uh, communities and relevant stakeholders. Uh, till date, we have <coughs> uh, uh, cleaned, uh, cleaned up about uh, 1,101 sites with, with the volunteers, uh, more than uh, 160,000, more than 160,000 people. Uh, but as time passed, we have changed our program because this cleanup, physical cleanup, cleanup is not necessarily uh, uh, a solution um, uh, because in Nepal, it's a bit more of a systemic, there's a big systemic issue in Nepal. And when we go for a cleanup, uh, it, uh, uh, it never, it's not, it's not a sustainable or sol solution driven campaign. So we have changed it a bit on this one. Um, talking about the project today, uh, as, um, as I said, uh, the project name is Expansion of Nepal Waste Map, a digital waste management system. Uh, by this, it, we have worked in a, in a community uh, in Bharatpur uh, metropolitan city uh, for the last couple of years in ward number 10, where we have mapped about uh, more than 10,000 households. Uh, and we, uh, we look forward to expanding it to two more wards uh, with another 10, 10, 10, more than 10,000 households. <clears throat> so before we, uh, before we go to uh, what the program is, we also wanted to, uh, and also what the problem is, we also uh, want to uh, let you know what is the solution here. Uh, waste has been always been a big issue in uh, uh, country is especially in Nepal, uh, but understanding the history of uh, waste in Nepal, its dynamic economy and culture. This project uh, 
uh, it is more of a small yet a must nudge toward resource recovery. Uh, at this current trend, countries are adapting to solutions such as waste to energy, landfill uh, for the urban waste issues. However, for Nepal, uh, we are at the beginning <coughs> stage of uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, development uh, where waste segregation is the sustainable solution that will not only incorporate the existing system, but also help re uh, recover valuable resources. However, uh, it, it's not easily said done. Uh, waste segregation, um, though it's such a simple term and such, uh, some, such a simple practice, you basically divide waste into three categories or four categories. In Japan, maybe 32 cat categories, but however, there lies an underpinned uh, series of uh, foundation uh, blocks that require coordination among stakeholders that needs to be placed um, before an effective solution is provided to the community. And, uh, to, uh, and to get to that solution, Clean Air plans to work with the government, uh, private waste sector, and also engage public to address the systemic issues uh, by stalling uh, these, uh, sorry, by stalling these uh, three uh, pillars in the program. Uh, as I said before, we have our Nepal West map. What we're trying to do is, uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the main focus of the project, uh, uh, the mapping of the, uh, of, of the two uh, ward uh, in, in the municipality. With that, we also want to work in uh, with, uh, with uh, providing them with the infrastructure uh, to recycle their waste. Then when we're talking about recycling waste, we're not talking about uh, waste that is already recyclable. We're talking about non-recyclable waste, such as uh, wrappers, uh, such as those noodle packages, biscuits packages. How can we recycle it? Or how can we actually uh, have a solution to those uh, uh, issues? And we also want to work on this concept of circular economy. This uh, it is very new to Nepal, circular economy. Right now, uh, people are slowly talking about it, uh, but it, the circle, the whole world, the buzz hasn't reached up to the government level. And that's what we wanted to do uh, in, in a long run. Uh, a little bit talking about the technology platform. This, this technology platform, we'll be focusing on this much uh, in the technology platform a lot because it helps in an in a analysis uh, through data collection. It also provides waste, uh, waste collection and management information for companies. It also helps with uh, citizens to engage with government and private waste sector uh, through, uh, uh, through, uh, reporting gov uh, uh, through reporting to each other. Let's say uh, if, uh, if a citizen wants to report a waste burning or if, if their waste is not picked up time, they can do so with this application. <clears throat> now, uh, the mapping and data collection uh, on uh, on waste related element uh, it's contributed to it's more of a uh, spatial and visual understanding of existing functional and operational and waste management. I'm reading over here. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, so that's what I, uh, as I said, um, uh, this technology helps in undertaking powerful analysis. And also, uh, I think I we talked about this. Sorry about this one. And th this is the structure. This is more of a wave dashboard and mobile application uh, of the uh, of the whole system. Over here, you can see uh, uh, the on the main navigation we have uh, so uh, wave, uh, smart waste dashboard that is that can be used by the government and by the private waste sector. There's also waste in the neighborhood, uh, and we have waste infrastructure where we uh, map waste bin, recycling center, transfer station, scab driller, composting center. And, uh, and also landfill sites. Uh, this is more of a, uh, the <clears throat> architecture of the system, where we map a waste infrastructure, waste collection, uh, of, uh, waste collection uh, services, routes, day schedule. Uh, other thing we map is waste service coverages, building category, which has been very important. I uh, before we talked about, <clears throat> we are a people centric organization. And these these solutions were uh, derived from the waste private waste sector. These were the need of the hour when we went there uh, with uh, with the support of the Asia Foundation and AC Mode. Um, these were the main uh, uh, what do you call it, bullet points that they require. 
Another, uh, another one is waste issue in a neighborhood. Now, waste issue in a neighborhood is a reporting mechanism. Um, and uh, we, sorry. Can you see my screen? Uh, not now. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I must no problem. Continue. No problem. No, no, no. Take your time. All right, no, no worries. Let me share that again. Yes, yeah. we can see it now. Okay. You have uh, a little bit more than five minutes to go. All right. Thank you. So, <clears throat> so um, with Nepal uh, Waste Map, what we aim to ensure is that a better data is available for informed decision uh, making, uh, planning, and monitoring waste related intervention and development work. This is what we're trying to do through this one uh, one part of the program. For the next what next part is called Precious Plastic. Uh, this is an initiative uh, started by Dave Hackens in the Netherlands. Uh, and this is a very simple idea of using different type of plastic, especially single use plastic to transform them into a different type of product by melting at a controlled temperature. Now, this may not be a, a sustainable solution, but this is something a low tech uh, <clears throat> and low, uh, low cost uh, technology that, uh, that, uh, that uh, when we went and talked to, uh, with entrepreneurs uh, and uh, youth and uh, women group, they, they, this seems to be very feasible. Uh, and uh, we have also done a little bit of research on this one. Uh, there's a short video. Uh, I hope you can, sorry about that. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I hope you like the video. Um, and uh, <clears throat> next one, uh, uh, we talked about circularity. Uh, as it says, um, only 9% around the globe, um, the circularity is practiced. And with the Nepal, uh, the surging economic growth, we also realized that how important it is to explore the concept of circular economy in this country, in this uh, in this country, 
So we, we, int we intend to prepare and publish a an, uh, manual related to circular economy to help the mayor uh, in future policy and decision making. Um, <clears throat> with, we, uh, with all these um, three uh, small mini projects, what we intend to do is uh, have, impact, go. got it, have impact in local government, private waste sector, and public. With local government, we, uh, we plan to provide data-driven solutions, allocate co contracts and set guidelines, monitor and evaluate services, and coordinate with the private sector, and also hand, hand over a handbook or a toolkit. The private waste sector, the, this will help them in plan, planning and implementation, uh, strategic allocation of resources, and also monitoring and improving uh, services. With public, uh, uh, report waste related issues, uh, access with collection information, receive instructional and guidelines, uh, participate in proper waste management, and also entrepreneurship opportunity uh, in waste. And uh, this is the end of my slide. Uh, I hope with this support, we aim, uh, we aim to empower citizens, uh, still good governance practice that is based upon data evidence and eventually improve the waste management system. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Amod, uh, to you for the presentation. Uh, I'd like to, to invite the, the, the jury members to switch on the, the video and, uh, and to start uh, um, asking, asking questions. Of course, uh, please, uh, anybody who's connected, please ask questions as well in the chat. Uh, um, I'd like to start with Parul, if, if that's okay, so that she, since she was last, last, last round. Uh, Parul, would you like to start? Yes, yes, Amod, uh, you know, good good presentation and really good proposal. You have hit the right points uh, given the global discussion on the importance of managing waste, uh, its contribution to effective GHG emissions, uh, you know, role of communities and stakeholder partnerships, um, as well as connecting uh, livelihood opportunities through discussions on circular economy. So, so it's uh, so you have uh, you know the proposal your uh, you know um, articulate some of the key priorities uh, globally. Um, my questions to you is um, I am having a little difficulty in understanding the exact scope of the project. So I understand that there is this um, uh, this mapping application. So if you can uh, clarify uh, that you would be scaling up this application to a new ward. Uh, two different words where it was not uh, previously done uh, uh, for data, for collection of data, for mapping of uh, you know information that you have presented, and the uh, if you could uh, you know just uh, just clarify on what the scope of the project is and this app, and then secondly. Um, um, there is also a lot of material uh, that is produced by a number of organizations, UN Habitat being one of them, uh, that have a lot of training modules, a lot of tools um, that look at uh, waste segregation, waste management, waste composition at the household level. So, um, what is the um, you know what is the level of familiarity of the team in application of uh, to these toolkits from? Either you inhabit it, or perhaps you know a lot of number of agencies are already working on, um, you know, on, in this sector. Am I, am so, to be, uh, have you am I, am I, am I, am I? that um, as well? Thank you, Barul. Uh, you, you, uh, if you can uh, answer in a couple of minutes, so we have enough time to to, to hear. Sure. So. Uh, with the, I'll go with the second question uh, in, in terms of uh, UN uh, resources. Uh, we actually looked into UN resources uh, three, four, five years ago, uh, and uh, it was not uh, contextual, contextual. And we actually created our own resources uh, from waste segregation, and also having that link with the uh, with the community. Uh, we've we've taken years uh, and maybe a couple of years to work with this TLO. Uh, we uh, <clears throat> have that link, and we also have our own resources uh, that will actually is very contextual. We have our own. Uh, uh, we, as I said, I work. We also work in a project called Zero Waste at School. They've created a character called Boomy, uh, 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 eight, uh, ten years uh, character, uh, who we, uh, who, uh, so who the company can really relate to. Uh, because of that, I think, uh, <clears throat> and we have found that our resources also very ha is very handy and very contextual. In terms of scope. Uh, we a uh, couple of years ago we had uh, 
uh, work with uh, ward number 10 um, and uh, with their request what we are trying to do is again extend it to another two uh, ward um, and uh, we also found that there is a gap uh, more than a scope there is this whole need for database the, uh, the government has finally understood how data what the data uh, can do and how how important data is uh, but <clears throat> uh, but only this uh, Nepal West map. Sometimes, if you're selling to the community, if you're selling to the government, uh, Nepal West map doesn't really. Uh, when you talk about data, it doesn't sell. That's why we have actually incorporated uh, the recycling uh, unit to it. A, a, a economy-driven, you know, a way our entrepreneurs can actually make money out of it, and uh, and a whole toolkit about circular economy, so that we can actually uh, enforce more on on data-driven uh, solutions. Uh, I hope this answers your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Maud. Uh, um, Ramona, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ahmad. Um, three very specific questions. And again, congratulations for the presentation. The first one um, relates to the public-private partnership that you mentioned. The public and the partnership is clear. I wanted you to spend a little bit more time explaining the role of the private sector. Is it just in the recycling of the plastic as you um, showed a little bit in your video as well? Or so where, where does that be um, come in? That's the first question. The second one is about the mobile app and it relates to what you were just talking about, getting the data. So there is a big difference between Obviously, a lot of people having access to mobile phones, which and that penetration has expanded rapidly, including in Nepal, versus being able to actually use an app and populate it, upload data, uh, photographs, information. So I wanted you to comment a little bit on that point as well, right? Because otherwise, um, the app is only as good as the data that goes into it. Um, and third, very quick question, is the mayor on board? Yes, uh, she is on board. Uh, we, we've been in touch with the mayor and um, we also, uh, we, we actually, we don't call this a Clean Up Nepal initiative. We also call the mayor's initiative on this one. Um, to your uh, second questions, this, is, this has actually truly been the biggest challenge for us, for public to utilize the app. Uh, I, I, will, I will not deny it. It's been very hard for, uh, for us to have public uh, engage in uh, or downloading the app. Uh, there are certain numbers of uh, uh, individuals who does it. Uh, we have we did a, a big sensitization program as well. Um, and when uh, we have to force to sustain the data because we also need the data as well. Uh, that that part is uh, uh, that part is done by the government. We ha we have something called toll in uh, TLO uh, where a community are formed by the government. That part is also done by them. And there is private waste se sector where all the data is collected. So there's a sustainability, but when it comes to users of the data, uh, 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 right now I have to agree, we need to find some kind of catch way, uh, uh, some kind of uh, incentive there uh, uh, to make sure that the, the that people use it. Uh, in Bharatpur, there are uh, we have about uh, I have the data somewhere here. We have a decent uh, download in uh, uh, Bharatpur, but uh, but in other 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 part of the city like Kathmandu, the the download the down especially the capital the download is really 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 down. But Bharatpur being a bit of a a, a bit of a decent uh, town, I think I uh, the download is decent over there. Uh, but I agree. Um, your first question was, I, I, I don't, can you? The private, the role of the private in the public-private partnerships. Oh, yes, sorry about that. Yes, uh, with that, what we're trying to do is, uh, there is this, again, we talked about TLO. Uh, TLO is a form, is a, is a community-based uh, uh, community, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, group that is formed by the government. And this, uh, we are talking about human, human group and hopefully youth group as well. Uh, this is where their partnership will come in. In partnership, uh, they will also be working together with the private waste sector. Uh, 
because that, that, that is where all the raw materials will be. Uh, they'll be working uh, uh, hand in hand with the private waste sector, with the government and, and, and the, and the uh, women group. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Tamod. Uh, Elena, would you like to come in? Yes, thank you, Francesco. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I, I'm sure that the community health impact, of course, will improve. But from, coming from the social development perspective, uh, you talked about livelihood improvement. How are livelihoods achieved in terms of are you partnering with the recycling companies? How are people supporting this approach? Uh, engage for sustainability. That's the first. And the second, whether there's been any uh, laws or rules in terms of uh, imposing uh, uh, fines on uh, people who litter. Have you been engaging on that front as well? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the first one, we do want to uh, focus on marginal uh, group. Uh, however, uh, at, at, at the first stage, for the sustainability of the project, we would have to go with the, uh, by the human group, the, the current <coughs> existing, uh, existing group, uh, which compromise of marginalized uh, group as well. So we'll be going with them uh, so that we can actually sustain the program. Uh, in terms of uh, rules and laws and regulations, we have that. The, um, uh, uh, this whole Nepal waste, I'll just take a minute, the whole this app came with this idea. Uh, there is a law that says, uh, you know, you, you can't do this, you can't litter, you can't burn waste, uh, you can't dump waste, but there is no reporting mechanism at all. You need a reporting me mechanism. And that's the whole idea came in because, and that's why we're trying to work with the government. We could have done it in a private sector or with the just, you know, uh, but this has to be instilled in the government system. Uh, so that that law can be actually implemented. I, I think this is a very good question. Thank you, Helen. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, any, any further questions from, from the jury? No? Thanks, thanks a lot. I don't see any questions from the audience either, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Thanks again, Amod, for the presentation. Thank for you. The, the Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, our third, third project, third finalist uh, um, for today um, is a project called a Water Kiosk at School, um, Karugia Secondary School, um, presented by the International Transformation Foundation, ITF. And uh, we have today Venuste Kubwimana, who is the Secretary General of um, ITF, uh, presents the project um, for us. Um, Welcome, Venuste. You have 15 minutes, so the floor is yours. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Venuste Kubimana. Um, I represent International Transformation Foundation. Um, at ITF, we are a network of young people or a community of young people from different backgrounds. Uh, what we do, we design and implement uh, youth-led uh, programs that are uh, contributing to further development of our communities. Uh, today, what I'm gonna do, I'm going to introduce you to one of our programs, a water kiosk at a school, that help urban and rural communities efficiently obtain access to clean water while at the same time uh, providing uh, business knowledge to the youth by combining quality urban infrastructure and community-driven governance. By the end of this uh, presentation, I hope to show you that Eotakio Scott is the most uh, innovative project, yet simple uh, to contribute to further development of every community, uh, especially in the developing world. The problem we are trying to solve with the water kiosk at the school is really simple. It is access to clean water in developing countries, especially in Africa, and how it affects education in these communities, especially when I talk about the young people, because in a cultural context in our countries, should, uh, young people and children are the one responsible for making sure the water is available in the household. 
Uh, especially, for example, going to the case of Kenya. In Kenya, only third, we found out that in Kenya, only a third of the population has access to clean water, close to their home at affordable prices. Um, children, school going children must walk at least four kilometers to secure water before or after going to school. In the most case scenarios, they drop out of school or go to school late. And these numbers tend to increase, especially in urban communities. The more the community is bigger, this distance increases. And this num the, the, the number of the student dropping of the school increases. That's why oh, we designed this project, a water kiosk at the school. Um, we wanted to make sure we finance these communities, set up a kiosk at, this, at their community schools, with the sustainable product so that the students will be able to transport the water from school to their homes. These kiosks are students run a business, selling water to the community residents at affordable price. I want to emphasize here that the price of the water at the kiosk is decided by the community. Right? This is really community driven a governance project because from the beginning to the end, the community is involved in every single step and the price of water is decided by the community to make sure it's affordable for everybody in the community. These kiosks also are educational and a profitable business, teaching the, these students who run them business and leadership skills, and at the same time, generating income for the school. Um, a water kiosk at the school is characterized by several products uh, that, that are environmental friendly and with technology to save water especially we have the refillable, reusable water bottle that the children use, and Jerry carry cuts to carry water from school to their homes, and the water saving tap station and uh, hand washing facilities that have uh, shown to be handy, especially in the time of COVID right now, to keep children safe and healthy at the school and the community. There are several benefits associated with water kiosk at the school, financial sustainability, improved sanitation and the health, education, the capacity building, but also the socioeconomic opportunity in the community. To date, uh, so far we have uh, built 15 kiosks in Kenya and Rwanda, and in the process, we're able to keep about 8,400 students in a school, and they have improved sanitation and health at their schools. Of course, in the process, about 7,000, these communities now have access to clean water at affordable price in their communities. Um, these have proven to be more successful social business model that is developing solidarities in these communities because the income the schools make, they spend more on education in the community and teaching these young people basic uh, business skills and entrepreneurship. I think that's why uh, in 2017, we were invited by the Rwanda government through the Ministry of Education to replicate this project in Rwanda. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, um, I have been trying to show you why water kiosk is the most innovative project with the quality urban infrastructure and community-driven governance. But now I would like to show you what we will do if we win this award, how it will make a difference for us. We will use the, this award to set up a water kiosk at the school model at Karugia Secondary School. Karugia Secondary School is located in central Kenya in a, in a location in a township called Karugia. Karugia is an urban community just like any other urban community, imagine there is a primary school, there's a secondary school, there's a shopping center, there is a health center, there's everything. But this community has no tap water system. They depend on rainwater. And due, when there is no rain, they have to go out of the town to fetch water from a river. This um, to us is really difficult to imagine, but it's the reality this community live in. If we win this award, we're able to set up a water system for this school and this entire community to benefit this, the schools the and the people living in this neighborhood, especially about 3,500 community residents and the, the student living, uh, studying at Karugia Secondary School and the Karugia Primary School. I want to, to conclude this presentation um, to show you the last evidence that water kiosk at school is the most innovative development program that because its benefits, it goes beyond 
uh, the basic and provide the ripple effect in the community. For example, look at this, uh, uh, my screen. I have a, a photo on the left from 2015 and a photo in 2019 of a school in, in, in Western Kenya at Chetais Primary School. I did mention earlier that in, for each school we go to, we, we set up a kiosk, every child receives a usable water bottle. On the left, what you see, it's the students at this school and the school compound that looks more of like Sahara Desert. They were lining up to receive reusable water bottle. You can see they have blue and uh, green, yellow bottles in their hands. This is their school in 2015. And in 2019, when we went to this, I, I took these pictures personally. When I went to this school, this is how it looks like, the school compound on the, on the right. This, the, the, you can see the children sitting in the beautiful environment. When we asked the teacher what happened, she said, with overflowing of water from the kiosk, we channeled the water to our school compound. And with the money we, we make from the water kiosk, we bought seedlings and we ask every child to adapt the tree to make sure they water this tree every day. And this is how they have changed the, this uh, school compound that looked more of like Sahara Desert into the most beautiful environment you would ever, you would ever see in most schools in Kenya. By voting for us to win this award, you will enable us to, to create this kind of impact in the other in, in a career. That's why we think uh, this is really the best way for us to to continue making this kind of impact in different communities in the Kenya, because this kind of a process that you can replicate in a different neighborhood. I think I still have some time, but I, I was going to show you a short video to see how a water kiosk goes at a school. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Venuska. Um, the presentation is finished, right? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, so I'd like to invite again our, our jurors to, to switch on the, the screen. Um, Ramona, why don't you go first? Since I put my camera on first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you, Venuska. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And. Um, Thank you for taking us to Africa as well on a little journey. It was really heartwarming to see um, the children in action, so to speak. So I have just uh, one question, which is about the maintenance of the water kiosk. Okay. This is generally a problem in terms of uh, water supply and providing access to water to various communities, right? Installing it is one thing. But of course, it requires regular maintenance. So, who is in charge of maintenance? Who will pay for it? Um, yes. That, that is that is the first question. Please go yeah. ahead. Yes. Okay. That's one the main question we found out when even before we started the project, we were trying to make sure it's sustainable. Uh, every now in Africa, there's so many organizations providing clean water to villages and the communities, but no one is really addressing the sustainability of it. So the main thing we focus on is to make sure the ma and whenever you do any kind of infrastructure, there's gonna be something breakdown along the way. With either today or after 10 years, the problem we found was that the communities did not have money or I would say goodwill to contribute money to, to repairing. So we did a water kiosk at the school, is, it's run like a business. A business that's run by the community, there is normally a community committee that supports school it's more of like oversight of the, the school and the school there is a teacher working with the students on day-to-day -day operations 
So every day there is a money the kiosk uh, make. So part of the money, there is a profit. The profit is saved to make sure when something is broken, they go, they use that money to fix anything. With, if it's a pipe, they can fix it. Mm. But if it's more technical part, that sometimes there is those products we give them, they will call us for, we have a technician on, on a, in our office who will go and support them. But if they need any expenses, come from the school account that the money they made from the kiosk. Okay, now that makes sense. And um, the, the children involved in managing it, these are primary school children? I mean, they were quite little in the video you showed us. What, you know, what age children are we talking about? And are they, are they also trained in how to manage and run a small business, essentially? As uh, small as it may be. <laughs> <laughs> in Kenya, uh, for I would go for a case of Kenya and Rwanda education system. So far, we are setting up the kiosk at uh, primary schools and the secondary schools. Primary school, you will find they are more between seven and fourteen years old. Where at uh, secondary school, they are more up to seventeen, eighteen. So part of the school is really normally when you go into the community, a school they choose that not everybody, every child will run the kiosk. They normally pick like kind of a committee or a kind of the senior school, the senior st students to run the kid. Like on daily basis, they kind of like interchange. Uh, when you come to the training, the, the, we have a, a rubber step by step to set up a water kiosk at the school. The last step one, the construction is complete. The last one is a training. So by the time we finish the construction, the school have designated the list of the students who or some they pick are like, Last, last year students, they give us the name of the students and by then also have a, com a committee from the community. Usually that's like committees like four people, the student number about like 18, 18 students. We provide day-to-day -day operational training like how they will do the recording and everything and how they will be the re doing the reporting. Of course, there is no matter what you call like social entrepreneurship training on, on, on our agenda. So there is a I, we do this, I think, for three days, three days training for the community uh, committee that would be involved and the school and the teacher who would be involved in learning of day-to-day -day operations of the kiosk. Thank you. Um, Helena, would you like to go next? Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, that's very good. Uh, person. It points to the right direction, but I have a few I'm trying to clarify in my mind how this works particularly yeah, yeah. given the answer you just provided uh it costs eight thousand dollars right the initial outlet is eight thousand dollars install right yeah. and then um you then provide water to the community right so how much do you charge the community for using the water that's my first question the second question is you also indicated that the kids they can take water home, right? After school, do 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 they pay? Who how how is that how is that process worked out? Second, third, the you mentioned about a revolving fund, right? I mean, I'm sure that of course these kids are trained, but to be more serious, what's the governance structure uh, okay. of the revolving fund, and how is that replenished? How how is this sustainable uh for instance uh these are the clarifications that i i i sort of like come into my mind um in in in, in looking at the future uh for instance of of this for sustainability thank you okay thank you so much uh i will go first up to the first question of setup cost versus the day uh charge per day like water charges per day like whenever someone come to buy water Setup cost, uh, so far the 15 water kiosks we have set up, the, the average cost was around 8,000. That's normally depend on where is the water source versus where the school is. Like the, the, the last point we are setting up the kiosk. That distance from, we're gonna bring water. That's really the main cost we get involved in much of the, the most expensive part of the project. But they are, the reason why also the cost usually is low, this is a community project. We only pay on the stuff that's really are technical, but things like uh, when you talk about bringing water, the many things you talk about is digging the trenches to bring water, buying the bricks and all those, those kind of stuff. 
the community members do those, I would say, handy jobs. They provide that. So there is less money involved buying this. This also contribute to the cost of water because there is not much in investment in the cash wise. That means water would be less cheap, cheap at the end when they're coming to buy water. The water price also depends now the cost of setting up what the cost of course how for example you find when we get the water supply from a public water source would it be a little bit cheaper depending on like how much they are selling the water on to the school because they supply water if we are getting water the water source from it's different per community depending on the source available we are able to sit in the community sit down if you are bringing water at this cost how much is affordable for everyone so the price per water is decided by the community. It's separate, kind of different to each community. But so far, the average we have in Kenya, it goes between two shillings to five shillings per jerrycan, 20 liter jerrycan. That's the first question. I hope I answered it correctly or I cleared that one. And then um, the other question was how the student, the student carry water to, the, to their homes after school and who pays for that? In a community, if you will, the schools must work with their community schools, which means the community members send their children to this school. So they came up with a mechanism for, I think in the video you saw where um, a child had the bottle kind of like a thing, they kind of punch to make a hole. The parents, sometimes they pay along with the school fees. So like every day, every child has allowance of one, one or two jerry can to come home with. So they will pay along with the school fees. That's the system I've been in many schools. That's uh, one. And the other one was revolving fund. The revolving fund, as I said, a water kiosk uh, it should be run by as a business for the school. There is a committee, there is a, the beginning of the project. We, we set up a committee from the community members, elected by the community members, by the way, not us. The community member sit down and elect a few people to work with the school to make sure it's sustainable. And the school set up another committee of the students. So these two work together to support each other. Revolving fund comes like on incomes. The project, for example, if it's a sustainable business, should have income on daily basis. The money they make should be, we make sure that the price of water is higher than, they, they are selling to the community, is higher than the, the money they will be paying for supply. So that profit is normally, we teach them about the trade part of the training or saving. If the, the profit is, let's say, 50 shilling a month, 40% normally go to saving for what you call revolving fund. They pay this money back to us. On a monthly basis, this money is put into our account. Once this, and this report is normally shared on a monthly basis. So this uh, saving, when it, it reached the same amount that we used to set up the, the entire process, now the community we're going to what we call the deployment. We deploy this amount to another community. This community might be involved in, say, they can they recommend because normally it's really the news go really fast, especially the neighbor community say, hey, let us please come help us too, come to our community. So the community might recommend the community neighbor neighboring community for us to invest this amount in their community, or we can we also go through the same evaluation process for next new communities. But the money we we deploy to new community comes from the business. Uh, saving. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Francesco. Can I just ask one quick question? Yeah. Uh, if I understood correctly, you indicated that the water, so the water is not coming from a borehole, right? It's supplied by the uh, city. No. Is that a ahead? borehole mechanism? No, not not in all scenarios a borehole because each community is different. If you go in a, in a specific community, either you're gonna find we see the most uh, you would go in a specific community. They, either there is a borehole as a water source. Sometimes, sometimes we prefer using a city supply because normally when you go into any community, there is normally especially in urban communities, even in rural community, there is normally a highway. Most a neighborhood, no matter how far the highway is. These highways have water pipeline uh, is already in the city or the country planning. It's easier to get water from this public water than a borehole because if you go with the borehole, you will have to pay more on treatment while the public water is already treated. So those kind of scenarios will go through the evaluation process in early stage to make sure which source do we work with that is affordable for the community. 
Thank you, Venus. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Parula to come in now with her own question. Okay. Yes, thank you, Nuste. And uh, I must say that, uh, you know, that was a good presentation and a very relevant theme, I mean, right, to uh, you know, access to safe water is uh, essential uh, in human rights. So it's commendable that you focus the proposal on this aspect. I think the other panelists have already covered quite a few uh, questions that I had in mind. Uh, but I would like to understand uh, a little bit more about the process of um, of community engagement uh, that you undertake, especially when it comes to uh, something like you know um, uh, fixing uh, uh, the right uh, tariff for uh, the price for uh, for water. And if you can also indicate like on an average, um, has it led to overall community savings? Uh, they have to uh, maybe they're saying uh, uh, higher or lower than what they collect mutually agreed to. So, so any any indication on that? Um, uh, if I might ask, the last question was not it was not uh, clear. Uh, if yeah, I'm sorry skip, about but... my <laughs> <laughs> you know, making a lot of noise in the background. Yes, yeah, so my so my last question was if you can give um, an indication on uh, on um, you know how what, what's the I'm trying to understand that the, the discussions around setting the right tariff on okay. water can be quite uh, controversial, you know, not an yeah. easy, easy job. So some, if you can share some experience on that and overall, um, based on your experience of implementing these projects uh, in the past, um, has it led to, like, what kind of savings has it led to uh, for the communities, you know, um, I mean, just from the experience of uh, of India, um, the, the informal communities often end up paying a lot more uh, per liter of water. Um, yeah. uh, so, just want to understand, um, you know, what's um, you know what's your experience in the projects? Were they able to access water for free earlier, but it was not safe? Versus with the project intervention, what has been the yes? Data? Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to make clear, like for example, before initially when we started, we were reaching out to the schools and the communities. Like I said, we are a network of young people. We are member, ITF is a member youth network of young people from different villages, from different communities. So it was initially was a little easier for us because we, we would get the recommendation of, by our members. So that was the first way to connect to a village or a community. But as, uh, as we start now, we are more, I would say the word of mouth of what we do, make the kind of marketing uh, easy for us. So the process to set up a kiosk, the first initial stage is contact with the school, either initially by us or reaching out to us or reaching out to existing water kiosk um, where we have a kiosk. Then th that's how kind of the first initial stage happened. Once we in a contact, we there is established contact with a specific school. For us, then the school we ask the school, okay, this is there is a form to feed to give us more more background of the situation about the community in the school. So usually we, our staff member work with the school to make this clear. And the next thing we do is community meeting. Initial, that, that's the first thing that happened. The, the schools you will find there are more community schools. That, that means usually the school have a, what we call community, the management committee. This, you will find it, their parents and there is a school, the local administration members. So we ask them, in, we, we, we talk with you, we understand the problem, we share everything we need to work on. But we ask them, invite the whole member, it's like, um, you know, it's like a political rally happened. So everybody comes sit together. I think we, did, we share our stuff, we say, normally we do this for almost like four days. No matter for each community to be on the same page about the project, take us about four days discussion. We, we share every single detail, people ask the questions, ask this and that, we clear everything. And then once during those meetings, that's when they, about the tariff or how to choose the price. Because everybody, of course, is gonna have an opinion in the community awareness meetings. But the, during the, the end of this kind of discussions, everything is kind of kind of like I would say, still enough, there is no definitive answer. But the community members then give the power to that committee that it, they voted to represent them to decide the price. Once the price is decided, based on the, of course, the cost estimation that we use to, to do the investment, we have another com community meeting. 
now they present this is how we think it will run the kiosk this is how much we think everybody can be able to afford to buy water from the kiosk so that's really in uh, i would say in the basic terms the process goes it's normally it's a wrong process that really but it have been um, more i would say eye opening for us working with the community and to decide everything from by them i don't know if i i made uh, clear for you now that's that's well articulated. Any any unique other question from any of the um, jurors? None from me, thank you. Yeah, yes, please. If I can ask her, because Boho, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't really convinced. Maybe this is in Kenya, but that Boho, you know, I have a Boho in 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 my house in Ghana, mm -hmm. and of course, I'm not there and some of the community they just come and get it because the more you take the more it's replenished yeah. so i mean you don't there isn't much effort i think the investment is basically the system itself and after mm -hmm. that unless of course they are, the, the 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 soil may not be conducive to having the ball water. but i think you know in, in connecting to city water for instance in some of these countries that there's already water shortage in the city so how are you connecting to the city uh, to, to make sure that they're sustainable? Yes. Uh, this is sustainable. Rather yes. than if you drill a borehole, unless they come and survey the land and say that water will not last. I think that's more sustainable. And not just that, it's also healthier for the community. Because the water is, like the city water is not very healthy in most of these countries. Thanks very much. Yeah. I want to clarify on these two things, okay? We have been doing this for the last couple of years. So we have gone through different scenarios, okay? B issue of boreholes, okay? During a borehole, it's really expensive. We are a small organization. I want to make this very clear. We don't have a, in, in per, per average, bo during a borehole in Kenya, it costs about 50,000 US dollars. That's the minimum, the, between 30 and 50,000. That's really the minimum if the, 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 the deep is, is water is kind of like a little bit shallow. The issue then comes with a borehole, it's prone to break. There is a situation that will happen really more regularly than public water system. That's our experience. That's first take it because it's so much money for us when I go to raise our money. That's really the number one why we don't like a borehole. When we go into a community, they have a borehole that's where it manages somebody from a distance, we'll work on that. But we, we, we pay attention to the situation with, on the management of that borehole. We go to, to kind of more studies on that. But when it comes to public water system, public water system in mostly in Kenya and in Rwanda, it's available. And our uh, treatment is not really expensive. What we do, because the problem is, it's they normally like supply water in specific route, maybe twice a week. So our problem now comes to what we call storage. I, I think it, when you are looking at the pictures in the presentation, there, you saw there is a tank nearby the kiosk building. That's a storage tank. We make sure each, each kiosk have enough storage tank to supply the community during those days where the water will not be supplied. That's really, uh, I want to make sure this is really very clear on this one. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. And then we'll have to, to wrap up now because we're, we're over time. But. Uh, I'd like to thank once uh, to thank once more, uh, of course, Vanessa, Shripurna, Pragya, sorry, I'm just forgetting. Uh, Amod. Mod, yes, Amod, uh, Black, uh, just uh, Black for a second, uh, and Amod, of course, uh, for the presentations and everybody else who joined. Um, now the, the jury will actually meet immediately. To, to 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 decide on, on how many awards to to, to give and and and, uh, and what kind of uh, uh, ranking to, to to settle on. So thanks again for everyone. I'd like to invite you uh, very uh, warmly to uh, the, the the session we'll have on Tuesday afternoon, uh, um, Central European time, two p.m. Uh, please check the program to check the time in your own time zone. Uh, well, we'll be celebrating the 20 years of this competition, and most importantly, uh, we'll be we'll be announcing winners uh, of, of the competition across the four categories that are running this year, of course, including including this one. So, I really uh, would like to invite everyone to join us um, again on Tuesday to find out who actually won uh, the awards. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, yeah. just to the jurors.
uh, you just received the Zoom link of a, of our email. Uh, we can just uh, switch switch to Zoom for the for the jury meeting. Thanks again, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Congratulations and good luck to the yeah. to the finalists. See you on Zoom. Congratulations. Thank you. We have a five minutes break, right? Hi, Helena, it's good to see you. Yes. Five minutes break, Francesco, right? Yes, five minutes break, and then we'll, uh, we'll reconvene on Zoom. Yeah? Bye-bye.